Hello everyone, it's ARI Seminar Day again. Welcome, welcome to today's ARI Seminar. It's a pretty exciting day today. It's our last ARI Seminar for the year. Ooh, what a year, <laughs> what a year it's been. <clears throat> but welcome, welcome to everybody for coming along today to two seminars in our final session for the year. I'd like to uh, begin by acknowledging that today I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri country. Pay my respects to traditional owners of Tungarong country and to traditional owners, First Nations people, elders past and present and any emerging leaders that are with us particularly today. I've just been thinking about the fact that this is our last ARI seminar for the year and um, that I don't, it's just weird the way that time has worked in this COVID period that we've been in. But I was thinking about all the different seminars that we've had today, this year rather. It's been such a varied year. We started with nature connectedness. So it's interesting that we're kind of finishing with a few things around nature connectedness and relationships with nature as well. We've talked about fish kills. We've talked about research on country. We've talked about genetics. We've talked about um, Restoration Australia. We've talked about measuring biodiversity, eels, deep learning and frog calls, um, bushfire recovery, of course, in this year, ecological modelling. We, we've talked about a wide range of things and it's been fascinating and I'm hugely grateful to everybody who has delivered seminars this year and all the people who have come along like you as audiences. Thank you and brought fantastic questions as well. It's a great conversation that we have every month. So thank you all for coming along today. And um, we're going to start. I think we've got a good number of people in the attendees list. So let's get started. We have two speakers today. Uh, they're both non-ARI people. We're branching out in our final one for the year a bit more. We've got Lisa Declain and we've got Kylie Sines. So welcome to both of them. Lisa is going to start with a really intriguing talk, uh, which might be new territory for some of you and familiar for others, but this is going to be fun. So um, sit back and enjoy this talk from Lisa on navigating stories, meanings and emotions as evidence, relationships with the native forest. Thanks, Lisa. Over to you. Thank you, and thank you to everyone who has joined this presentation. I would also like to respectfully acknowledge the elders past, present and future of the Kulin Nation on whose unceded lands I live, learn and work. So for today's presentation, I'll be exploring people's stories, meanings and emotions in relation to particular places as important evidence in decision making. The presentation is based on my PhD research, which I completed in December last year. So what I will discuss. Firstly, I'll provide an overview of my research interests and environmental justice, which was the research frame, so you can understand the theoretical approach to the work. I will talk through what I did, including how I identified participants, conducted interviews and explored themes through thematic analysis. Then I'll present the findings of the work, including some of the rich relationships with the native forest that was so generously shared by the participants in the research. And finally, I'll discuss what these relationships offer in terms of understanding the forest and contribution to process from a justice perspective. So a little bit about my research interests. I'm a social scientist by training, so my undergraduate masters and PhD were all in social sciences, environment and planning at RMIT. And my research centres on thinking through environmental justice as an approach to ethics, governance and diverse connections with nature. I'm also an environmental consultant and have been for over a decade. I work with organisations on their environmental strategies and programs. I say this because my research informs my work and of course my consulting work informs my research in terms of how this uh, research might be applied, which is a very challenging space and I'm sure you'll be attuned to that as I talk through the presentation. So I chose environmental justice as a frame to guide my entire project. Environmental justice is concerned with both the environment and social justice. It sees the justice elements in relation to environmental issues. For example, a key question in Victoria is, 
which communities and environments shoulder the burden of pollution from energy generation, which we all use and benefit from in our daily lives, and why are these communities more exposed and how can the situation be transformed for justice for people and the environment? So the origins of environmental justice are in community activism around the world. It derives from groups that are marginalised by race and class as examples, fighting to protect their communities from the inequitable exposure to negative environmental risks and impacts, such as the siting of ma and management of polluting facilities. And also their fights to protect the environments that they rely on culturally, emotionally, spiritually, and for their livelihoods, such as protecting forests and river systems. Over time, this community-based frame has evolved and it's been expressed and applied in policy, scholarship and activism in Victoria. So in governance in Victoria, environmental justice was used as a frame in the review of the Environment Protection Authority and also in Victoria's biodiversity plan. In the EPA, the frame included three key areas. So outcomes, the outcome being sought, which was equitable protection for communities from environmental hazards and local communities close to industrial activities were mentioned as an example, and also improved process for communities to engage in decision-making processes, such as providing greater access to information and also contributing to pollution monitoring through citizen science. Restorative justice uh, as a response to harm was also included. The Victorian Biodiversity Plan also included environmental justice, but a distinct framing. So it focuses on facilitating access to nature for enjoyment and recreation, mental and physical health, and cultural and spiritual access and connection. And understanding the barriers for diverse cultural groups in their access to nature was also a consideration. So you can see these central themes arising. There are themes around outcomes of health, equity for people, environmental benefits and burdens, and engaging communities in process. So again, these themes are analysed and explored in scholarship. A prominent theoretical framework includes considerations of three types of justice. So distributive justice, which is how environmental benefits and burdens are distributed across communities. Procedural justice, which is about involving communities in decision making in accessible, meaningful and influential ways. And recognition justice, which involves recognition of communities' interests, values, identities, practices and ways of knowing and also recognition of different species and systems as having rights. In all expressions of environmental justice, it's important to return to the grounded community-based approach, where at its essence, it's about marginalised people and their experience of environmental injustice, their explanations of the causes of the injustices they have faced, and their visions of environmental justice. And it's through understanding their perspectives and their claims that we can find pathways towards change, towards more situated, ecologically centred relationships and governance. So how did I explore relationships with the native forest and governance through an environmental justice frame? I received ethics approval from RMIT University, which is a requirement in academic research. However, I also chose to take the extended process so that I could include people who identified as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and people under 18, because I wanted to be as inclusive as possible. As a grounded approach, I really wanted to understand people's relationships in a rich and tangible way. So I centred a native forest in the research and identified people who had relationships with that forest as potential participants. That meant that I invited a broad range of people to be interviewed and talked to um, People such as locals, a Tangerang elder, business owners, foresters, artists, hunters, motor bike riders, conservationist scientists, bureaucrats, uh, members of parliament and more. My overall ethical approach was one that's described in the literature as do no harm. So this is to do no harm to anyone involved with the research, no harm to the setting, no harm to myself as the researcher and no harm to the reciprocal relationships within the setting. So after going through this process, I interviewed 37 people in 32 interviews from 2016 to 2017. So how did I conduct my interviews? I tried to make the interview process as easy as possible for people. I went to the locations that they chose and stayed for as long as they wanted to talk. My shortest in-person interview was 45 minutes and my longest was around seven hours. We talked for an entire day. 
I held semi-structured in-depth interviews. So this means that I prepared plain language questions organized around my theoretical framework as prompts. And those questions were around relationships with the forest, those principles of justice I mentioned, so distributive, procedural and recognition, and also people's visions of justice. But then rather than ask these questions in any structured way, what I would generally do is start by asking question, uh, asking people a question about, say, their latest experience in the forest. And then I would explore the themes through their stories. So my intention was them, for them to frame the issues and their relationships in their own terms. And what this approach does is center the participants. It recognizes them as knowers and experts of their world. And what this produces is non-standardized information. So really rich information that draws out stories and places and emotions and different entities. And really it's anything that is meaningful to people. So then it came to analysis. I had almost 290,000 transcribed words, which is around 500 to 600 pages. And I imported all of this information into Invivo, which is qualitative software and set about coding. So I tried different methods of analyzing the data and settled on broad themes. I found that fine codes and tables simplified and fragmented the stories and lost context and complex links and relationships. And I wanted to maintain this complexity for a deep understanding. And being true to this approach, I then wrote up the data as a story. So stories facilitate the insight, uh, insight into settings and people and how they influence each other and how understandings and outcomes evolve. This is what the literature tells us that it does. And uh, this is what my experience was as well. So what did the interviews and analysis tell me? So quite honestly, going into the research, I expected that I would be writing a thesis around procedural justice and process. But after this really intense period of sort of transcribing all the interviews and analysing them, it was clear that what was most important to people was their relationship with the forest. So people described intimate relationships. They had relationships with trees that they loved, birds living in local spaces, and moments of quiet and solitude. They described the relationships and the way that they described them brought all these entities and places to life as meaningful. Their knowing was situated and involved multiple ways of knowing. So everyone drew on a combination of science, experience, emotions, stories, and art. And these diverse ways of knowing manifested and collectively developed their understanding. And people's experience of the forest was embodied. They felt this sense of love and loss in response to the different states of the forest. And it was the combination of the intimate relationships, situated knowing and love and loss that gave people a sense of identity and integrity with regard to their claims for the forest. What they also demonstrated was that the forest had its own identity in the relationships as a crucial part of developing the relationship and also their sense of responsibility towards the forest. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share a few stories and quotes so that you understand the type of information that comes out of this process of uh, qualitative analysis and qualitative methods. And also so you can see how the themes were developed and how they might apply in process. So the first person I'm going to highlight is Mick Harding, who is a Tangerang elder. So what stood out in Mick's story was that knowledge is developed in response to a place and through story. Developing knowledge in this way teaches people about the relationships between things and how things belong in that place. With belonging, knowledge and relationships comes responsibility. And fundamental to the relationship is a spiritual relationship with country. So let's listen to Mick in his own words. Mick, Mick explained, if you're living in the spot 24 seven, it's your home. That's where it breaks back down to how our people were so successful, science, good science, observe, try something, works or doesn't work, you repeat it or you improve it and you do it for thousands of years or thousands of generations. And you know what your relationship is to one another and you know what your relationship is to everything else as well. And it's relationship, with the word relationship comes responsibility. So Mick also talked about justice and stories. He says, if you're going to use the word justice, what does it mean? And what does it mean for everything and everyone? Because it's exactly the same as saying we're the highest people. 
some people can have the mindset that they think that because we can problem solve, we're the highest order of being on the earth. And in fact, I think there's nothing that could be further from the truth. Every animal has culture. And how do I know that? I don't know just by my observation. I know that by my stories, by the stories that have been left for me from my old people about our connection to the earth and connection to our country. So mixed relationship is based on a sense of responsibility. It's not about ownership. And it's about responsibility to maintain a healthy system for a range of entities for 10 generations to come. The next person I'm going to foreground is a local resident. So just to reinforce as well that these are snapshots of the interviews. The interview with the local resident went for around four hours and they talked about multiple ways of knowing and multiple sort of relationships uh, with governance and with the forest. But what I want to foreground here is love because the local resident's love was palpable in the interview. So love means that the local resident acknowledges different species and places as part of his family. These things have agency and are important in themselves and need to be recognised and protected. So the local resident says, I've got a funny sort of relationship with natural history and things that I'm looking for find me. I don't find them, they find me. So you can hear the sense of agency for other species. And the resident loved birds. One day I heard the unmistakable call of a white goshawk and much fuss from magpies. And I looked up and a white goshawk was flying by, so I videoed it, got my record of it, and was amazed that such a wonderful bird should come across my radar again on my home territory. And he also experienced trauma in both the 2009 fires and or in fires generally, and in relation to the damage to the forest. So in relation to the 2009 fires, he said, Live birds were running in front of us, doing strange things with their wings over their heads in a blind panic. It was awful to leave them. And later in the interview, you asked how I cope. I don't cope all that well. I'm getting desperate, actually, for protection of the forest so close to where we live. Every time it gets butchered, it's like another limb of mine being cut off. So you can hear the feeling and emotional intensity in his words. And another relationship I'd like to share is the deer hunters. So this relationship primarily derived from time spent in the forest, often alone, attentive to the conditions and engaging in a skilled activity. The nature of the relationship and belief in land management led to them to identify as hunters and also environmentalists. And what I'd like to foreground here is that spending time in the forest in quiet and solitude, and that the environment has always been part of human activity, which informs their understanding of the environment and land management. So in the hunter's words, you can be in the strangest part of terrain and you will find a tree stump that has been sawn with a handsaw, but it's been cut. You can see it's maybe 60 or 70 years old, the stump, and this is miles from tracks. Sometimes you can find collections of beer bottles where workers, well, I found a few, but the point is there's no such area in Australia that wasn't touched at some stage or another. And another quote. People who are true hunters, especially deer hunters more than anything else, if you're a deer hunter and you are not happy being in the environment and not happy with your own company and just being out there and sitting there having lunch in amongst all the forest, you're not going to be a deer hunter for very long. And there's one more relationship that I'd like to highlight, and this is related to the artists. So I talked to multiple, multiple artists and many people took photographs as part of their relationship with the forest. But the artist had a particular approach. And so there's, it's a deliberate creative act designed to communicate and have an effect. So for the local, local artists, it was intimacy, emotion, and the intent to create a connection that was central to their expression. So from one artist, they said, it just doesn't become a point of argument because you're tapping into another level of the human emotion. People just look at a beautiful image or a beautiful scene and it's not scientific, it's not elitist. It's based on a primal emotion of having a passion for something. And another artist talked about art as therapy. And this next quote discusses the importance of art working in conjunction with science. I read that science should always be working with the arts rather than coming up with a hypothesis and then proving it, which limits our thinking. Whereas von Goethe said, we should always be in a space of wonder. We should never anticipate the answer because therefore the answer can never come forward. And when you observe the world in a space of wonder, you can receive so much more information. That's why he said that the artist 
should always be working alongside. And they did once upon a time. The botanist always worked as an artist or had an artist working with them. To understand nature, you had the artistic perception, understanding movement, understanding sound and song, and that's not happening anymore. They saw art essentially as conveying an understanding of the forest that is not available in other forms of expression. That art inspired and developed understanding alongside other ways of knowing and helped to develop an emotional connection, which is fundamental to being human. So it might seem like I'm putting these different perspectives uh, together along a spectrum or in opposition, but that's not my intention. What I'm demonstrating is that there are multiple relationships with the forest. They are all existent and they all provide insight into the forest itself. So what does all this information tell us and how does it relate to justice and process? So taking a grounded qualitative approach reveals what is meaningful to people. It provides space for them to frame what the issue is and what justice and injustice look like. And taking an approach based on inviting complexity and thinking through relationships brings so many entities to the fore. It brings pollinators, dirt, plants, bacteria, animals and specific multiple, uh, moments, places and emotions. And then by doing so, it considers, it brings these things in as important, relevant and legitimate considerations in decision-making processes. Qualitative information also contributes to understanding. It provides necessary insight and information alongside other forms of knowledge. So I know that you use this information, that you engage people in your processes and your policies and your programs. And as a consultant, I'm often sort of wanting this work and yearning for this sort of information in my work. So sometimes when I start a project, I'm directed to literature to review. So often it includes ecological, planning, legal, economic and administrative information. And for me, what is missing sometimes are these social values and First Nations people's knowledge, stories and connections to country. Because without these, I just feel like I don't have quite a complete data set to work with. And I'm not saying that qualitative information should replace other ways of knowing, and I'm not trying to establish another hierarchy such that qualitative information is more important. But what I'm saying is that it informs understanding. And what I would advocate for is that if we're making a decision about a place, then situated detailed knowledge of that place is a necessary condition for understanding. And then the information provides opportunities. So it helps us move beyond a narrow and possibly entrenched definition of a thing. For example, forests are often represented as a resource and providing ecosystem services for people, or and then therefore should be managed, or as a place of biodiversity value to be protected. And the, the forest is these things. And it's also through the interviews, we can see it's a place for skilled activities. It's a home to a range of species. It's a place of wonder and beauty that can't be substituted and a place of belonging that, bling, that brings responsibilities. And so this is the next opportunity. So with this both expanded and situated understanding, it provides us with an opportunity for ethical direction. So we can explore our responsibility to this complex system incorporating these diverse representations and relationships. Taking this type of approach is a matter of justice in itself and foregrounding perspectives of people who are marginalised and disempowered is necessary to understand and respond to injustice. It takes time, respect, sensitivity. It's complex, sometimes messy, but it can be done with a clear methodological and ethical approach and more time and attention and working with the people who have participated in your research. And what and amongst all the difference and amongst all the kind of competing perspectives and the nuances that might arise, what does become clear is that the forest is fundamental to relationships as a complex system and a home. It is within the data, the sort of primary principle. So I hope this presentation has helped to give you some insight into qualitative data, what it can offer and how it might contribute to process. And my last slide is just to present a few key references that have been guiding in the research. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Lisa. It reminds me of, um, you know, the way that we think about all these things as data. So you've talked about these responses today as data, and there's another, um, there's another sphere or layer or scale at which we think of that too, which is when we think about our own emotional intelligence, we think about our own emotions as data. So I'm kind of interested in this, you know, different scales of 
um, emotions and meaning and responses as data. So we'll have another long chat about this some other day. But, <laughs> but right now, um, I really want to introduce you to Kylie Symes, who's going to be talking with us today about kind of imagining an urban nature and urban jungles and things. Kylie, can you um, share your screen with us? Here it comes. Yeah, it's Stuck in the city with you, conserving species on our doorstep. So great to have Kylie with us today from Melbourne Uni. Thanks so much. Over to you, Kylie. And please, everyone, put your questions in the chat as we go and we'll have questions for Kylie afterwards. Thanks, Kylie. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm going to be talking all things urban biodiversity conservation and uh, drawing a lot on some of the themes that Lisa has given us. So we know that nature in cities is good for people. Um, it's good for our health and well-being. As Lisa has just so beautifully illustrated, it's also really important for those connections to nature, as well as providing ecosystem services. But uh, the traditional narrative is that cities aren't that great for conservation per se. Um, when we think about doing biodiversity conservation, cities are not really considered the best bang for your buck or haven't been in the past. And this is an idea that we uh, explored a lot uh, through the Clean Air and Urban Landscapes Hub. And I was lucky enough to lead the shared urban habitat alongside Cara Trailful and this amazing group of researchers. And what we did was explore ideas like bringing nature back into cities, the role of uh, urban citizen science in engaging communities, uh, developing frameworks for improving ecological connectivity in cities, investigating indigenous led research on biodiversity in the city and those sorts of opportunities, as well as practical actions for urban conservation. And we were generally looking at the role of cities in supporting biodiversity, developing strategies to conserve it, uh, and working on an evidence base for urban conservation. So what I'm going to talk about today is, I guess, the current thinking around biodiversity conservation in cities and some of the lessons that we learned through this research. And at its core, it's an exercise in changing narratives, identifying opportunities and solving problems. So I'm going to explore this using two of those examples. I'm not going to go through the multitude of projects that I just listed. Um, the first is threatened species in cities. So what role do cities and towns play in threatened species conservation? And the second is what I've called lessons from the front line. So looking at what's already happening on the ground in terms of urban conservation. What are the pathways and challenges? So first thing we'll tackle one misconception is that there's nothing really valuable in cities when it comes to ecology and conservation. Nature, conservation and all of its wonder and glory looks like this. Um, not so much what we see in the typical urban narrative of this. And to explore this, a few researchers started the Threatened Species in Cities project. And the first piece of work out of that was led by Chris Ives and Pia Lantini and co. And they investigated Australia's federally listed threatened species and found that about 30% of them occur in cities and towns. And when you compare the area, as they found that cities and towns are just as important as non-urban areas for threatened species conservation. So we took this idea and uh, developed a bit of a working group to think about it a bit more clearly, because there were still a lot of questions to ask about what kinds of species and how do we do this and how urban are they in the first place. And this was a collaboration between the Clean Air and Urban Landscapes Hub and the Threatened Species Recovery Hub. And to give you an idea of what we did, uh, we used the urban boundary of 99 cities and towns across Australia. So this was a really wide range of things that we've called cities here. It could be, you know, small towns like Torquay, back to capital cities like Sydney and Melbourne and everything in between. And we, it was basically anything with a human population of more than 10,000 people as a benchmark. So this black outline here on the screen represents what we call the urban boundary. And the red is the species range. And these species ranges were modelled distributions from the um, federal government's data set of threatened species. So basically wherever we thought the species are either known to occur or very likely to occur. 
Uh, we cross-checked this to make sure that these were sensible and didn't have any dodgy records, and we came up with about 423 species across 99 Australian cities and towns. So this is the type of threatened species that we're getting in our cities and towns. And there was a wide range of species and overlap. So we have the Morrisby's gum here in Hobart, and you can see its entire range is completely confined to within the urban area. Then we have uh, species like the magenta lilypilly, which is pretty widespread but patchily distributed, but a really large proportion of those patches coincide with urban areas up and down the east coast. There are species like the swift parrot, which don't typically reside in urban areas, but cities and towns all along the east coast are quite important foraging habitats along their migration. Then we have species at the other end of the spectrum, like the greater bilby, which again, wide patchily distributed, but pretty much not in any cities, maybe tiny bits on the edge. And in these cases, maybe cities are not critical for their conservation future. So we considered the different ways that urban areas could contribute to conservation based on this degree of overlap between threatened species and cities. And some of the things to focus on here are, there are species that really do have quite a large proportion of their range overlapping with cities. They might be urban restricted or really highly urban. And so for these species, it makes sense that we have conservation action within cities and towns. It's really important. Then there are species that might occur in multiple different cities and towns, either because they have a really widespread range or because they're migratory. And in these cases, there are opportunities for coordinated action across multiple cities or making sure that our cities provide those seasonal resources that the species needs and don't introduce any new threats along their migratory pathways. Then we could have uh, historical species. So these are species that used to occur in cities, but have since gone locally extinct. And they might be opportunities for reintroduction, for bringing um, species back. We also reviewed the recovery documents, the federal recovery documents for these species. Um, it was a lot of <laughs> recovery documents to read. Uh, but what we found was that we're really great at recognising that urbanisation is a threat to species, but not so great at recognising that there's a need or an opportunity for urban conservation. So these are three groups of species that you would expect urban conservation to be pretty important for based on their spatial overlap. And you can see we've straight away identified that urbanisation is really, really bad, but not so good at recognising that firstly, the species occurred in cities, that they might use novel or artificial habitats that are pretty common in cities. And when you get to the highly urban and many city species, there's hardly any recognition that urban areas are important for their recovery. We also noticed that common threats like noise and light, um, collisions with vehicles and buildings were hardly ever presented in the recovery documents. Um, my colleague, Pia Lentini and I looked into this idea of urban restricted threatened species in more detail. So we cross-checked all the species that had really tiny distributions and found that 39 of those only occurred within Australian cities and towns. So these are species that nowhere else in the world, just one city and town in Australia um, provides habitat for these species now. This is my favourite example of one of those species. It's a sunshine diurus from Melbourne. Um, very, very endangered orchid that was once so common that they called it snow in the paddocks. As often with the stories with threatened species, it's like they were so common, they were falling out of the sky. And now all of a sudden, they only occur in one railway side in sunshine. That's where the last natural population of this plant is. And it's a really good example of some of the key messages that we learned from urban um, occurring, threat, or urban restricted threatened species. So when cities are the last chance for saving species, as in this case, we cannot rely just on secure land tenures. We know that it's an important conservation approach and we know that it's um, really helpful, but it's a luxury that many urban restricted threatened species just can't afford when it comes to competing for different uses of land in urban areas or simply the land prices of securing tenure. When cities are the last chance for saving species, we must better protect species on land that wasn't intended for conservation. So as I mentioned, the last natural population of the sunshine diurus occurs in a railway, um, railway side. And this is typical of most 
of these urban restricted threatened species and indeed a lot of the other threatened species. They're occurring in cemeteries and airports and roadsides and schoolyards. We need to get better at conserving species on these areas that would traditionally not be prioritised for conservation or considered at all. Uh, community engagement is really, really important. This is a theme that's going to keep coming up through my talk today. So the local community really got behind the Sunshine Diurus. They've done crowdfunding campaigns. They've staked out its habitat to make sure that nobody steals it in the night. Um, they've been really critical in preventing the extinction of this species. I, I don't think that this species would still be around without the engaged community. And this is normally something like living alongside or close to people is normally something that we consider a really big threat to threatened species. But when we're talking about urban conservation, we need to better consider the positive role that people can play in conservation. But to do that, we have to know that cities are the last chance for saving species. And you can't protect what you're not aware of. And the big takeaway for us from this urban restricted threatened species research was how little people, including policymakers, local governments, were aware that in some cases these species occurred nowhere else in the world. As a way to combat that, we've started to um, produce this online uh, resource. It's a, it's a map, it's an interactive map that you can go to and click on the various cities from across Australia and look at which species are listed in your cities. So for the second part, I'm going to talk about the misconception that, okay, fine, there's threatened species in cities, but there's probably not that much we can do about it. And we wanted to look at what was happening on the ground in terms of urban conservation. And originally we thought, oh, we'll review all the scientific literature, we'll pull it all together and figure out what's happening and how well it's worked. Uh, but we quickly realised that the vast majority of conservation action, the real front line, is happening in local councils and community groups. And these are people that are too busy doing things instead of publishing about them. So what we did was went out and spoke to them. We interviewed 26 urban land managers from across Australia, including local and state governments, non-government organisations and community groups. And we asked, you know, what are the current approaches to urban conservation? What actions are you doing? What are the barriers that you face and the solutions that you've come up with and the future opportunities? We just really wanted the nuts and bolts of what was happening on the ground. And the first important research that came out of that um, was again about community engagement. So we found a consistent desire to engage Indigenous perspectives and knowledges, but also this consistent, I guess, lack of, they just weren't sure how in many cases. So what we did was collaborate with Indigilab and they did a review of the research that we had on board and the responses that we got from the um, from the urban land managers and they came up with these uh, practical actions and guidance that urban land managers can take when it comes to Indigenous engagement and bringing Indigenous perspectives into their urban biodiversity actions. And this is a resource that's available um, online. Community engagement is also an enormous part of the work of environmental managers. They're not just planting things, they're spending all of their time talking to people about what should be planted and where. Um, they often express surprise to us about how much of their day-to-day -day work was engaging with the community. And they also noted that volunteers were a real driving force. Um, again, people on the ground are helping get urban conservation done, but there are real concerns about the longevity of this workforce, people getting tired, people dropping out, people moving away, and how are they gonna sustain their urban conservation action if suddenly their volunteer um, force is no longer there. They talked about the kinds of actions they did and we were completely blown away by the breadth of activities. We catalogued 318 actions um, and created this inventory ranging from ecological burns to changing the width of pathways to reduce their impact on the matrix. Uh, there were no mo zones, carving hollows into trees, fishways in urban creeks, changing backyard pools into ponds, introducing native mistletoe to non-native street trees, and again, lots of community engagement around um, nature tours and art installations and gardens for wildlife and citizen science. There were really big complex actions like converting golf courses and industrial parks into naturalised wetlands, 
or small but equally complex actions like putting native street, streetscapes in the CBD. My favourite example of community engagement was the Hume City Council who created a guide to identifying local bird species that the school kids then ran around the neighbourhood like they were chasing Pokemon trying to tick off all the birds that they could see. And then recycling habitats. So for example, trees that become dangerous in urban environments and might need to be re relocated. Instead of mulching them, they were recycled and placed in safer locations where they could provide habitat for wildlife. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, the things that we discovered. We also asked them about the process of urban conservation. So how do they get stuff done and what helps? And ideally it goes a little bit like this. We have a cool idea, we do the cool idea and we have uh, biodiversity in cities. But what happened more often was something like this. We have the cool idea and then we come up against 600 different reasons why that's going to be too difficult to do. Luckily for us, uh, nobody stopped there. They came up with what we categorised as four different leverage points that helped them combat these common barriers. And these were project management, capacity, stakeholder values and organisational support. And so what they did was take these barriers and come up with solutions that we called enablers that would help them either make it easier for their conservation work or biodiversity work to happen or circumvent some of those barriers. So instead of halting urban biodiversity action, we have all of these solutions. And something that was really interesting to us through the interviews is that what was presented as a barrier by one uh, by one interviewee, that problem had actually been solved by another interviewee and they just hadn't, um, they, they hadn't, they have no format for sharing that knowledge that, hey, I've actually had that problem over here. Here's how you can solve it and make this happen. We also asked them what their top lessons were from urban biodiversity conservation and created this booklet, which I think is uh, equal parts beautiful and inspiring. And some of my favourite quotes um, still touch on those issues. One person thought, I thought it'd be easier. It's harder than I thought it would be to convince funders that what we do is good and worthy. And to me, this should just be self-evident. And this speaks to the struggle that they have in just getting urban biodiversity conservation done. This one speaks to the lack of information sharing. There are lots of gaps between organisations and councils. And again, that harks back to some of those barriers that we've pointed out. And finally, a more positive one was to focus on the small wins or you'll quickly use lose heart. Realise that every little win is something that you wouldn't have got done otherwise. And I think that's a really important message to remember for urban conservation because it, it's not going to be about one giant sweeping action that fixes, fixes the entire landscape. This is about little wins that we're celebrating over and over again. So to wrap up, um, we can and must get better at biodiversity conservation in cities and towns. Some of the things that we need to do that are better research on the threats and evaluation of actions that can solve them. Strategies for small unconventional spaces, especially those that would traditionally be overlooked by conservation. And greater support and awareness for the people on the ground, linking those ideas together, um, creating ways for better learning so that we can share how we got around all of those barriers. And of course, community engagement. Community are so key. There's, they benefit so much from urban nature conservation. They inspire urban nature conservation and they get it done. This is my uh, details if you need to contact me and all the resources that I spoke of are available online and I'll finish up there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kylie. That's fantastic. And um, oh, it just resonates so much with a lot of the work that we've been doing in Delk as well around Victorians valuing nature and encouraging people to connect with and act for nature in all kinds of environments, um, including urban environments, of course. And I think it's absolutely time for many of us to you know, reframe the relationships that people have with nature to one of more like reciprocity with country, really. And, identifying some of the barriers to help people do that is, is really important. So thank you. Um, Andy, how are we going with questions? I'm going to jump in and have a look at what they are. What have we discovered? 
I've got a great one here, and I think it really highlights that uh, celebrating small successes. So Greg's asked, uh, how do we raise the profile of these great success stories? Uh, do we need something like a Tidy Towns Award for something like this? Yeah, I've thought a lot about this. Um, I think there are so many good opportunities and I'm, I'm hoping to get some off the ground eventually, but those things are so important. Um, there's a little book I have somewhere which was, it was like a little awards booklet for conservation action on private land. And most of it was in rural agricultural areas, but people were able to write in a short story of what they did, um, send in pictures of their land and the restoration actions. And these were all compiled in this wonderful book of really positive stories um, of successful conservation action on private land. And I think we need something like that for, for urban environments because so much of it is people learning from each other and, and building that muscle memory to see that, oh, that we could do that. Like we can do that here. Um, yeah, I think every time I see any kind of small urban conservation project shared on social media, for example, all of the comments are like, this is fantastic. Why don't we have this here? Um, so yeah, I think sharing those stories is, is really important. I'd love to do something like that. Thank you very much. Um, another question here is around, again, the similar vein to the question Lisa got is around how do we advise, um, I guess, decision makers, government or politicians about uh, some of the, <laughs> of the, how do we actually value the things around us a little bit more? So maybe not less so about the positive stories, but just that core sense of valuing nature. Yeah, I think as Lisa touched on as well through her presentation, that's a lot more about story. Um, so I'm at all levels of government all the time with this information. I'm like, I've got this data, I've got this, there are these many species here. But when you talk to, if you find out where people are from and you talk to them about the species that they see and they encounter and how that makes them feel and what it would mean to them if they were no longer in the landscape. So, you know, I had a blue banded bee come to my yard a lot last year and I haven't seen it this year and I'm pretty devastated because I'm like, where is this bee? It used to be here. Um, they're the they're the ways to get in you know the data kind of comes second if you can connect people to those feelings that they have about nature and how important that is um that's the real the real turning point because all the data to support the action that's great once you've got them on board to um to drive the action in the first place uh, so you know in terms of putting this on the radar of, of levels of government we're working on that all the time we worked really closely with the federal government um we're trying to work closely with state and local councils a lot as well now. So, yeah, it's just, it's a slow tide, but it's definitely turning, I think. Thank you very much. Um, this question I'm going to interpret around as being, how do we prioritise the actions in urban areas? Do we focus on these general sort of actions we can do, or do we focus on specific species? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Look, it's really hard. Um, I think prioritizations are hard anyway, so I'm not going to say that it's especially hard in urban areas, but I think we don't yet have a framework that helps people think about the things that are important for an urban prioritization. So that's where prioritizations fall down if you're missing something that's actually important to guide what decision you make. So, you know, there are species that we could easily say, uh, you know, maybe easy wins, um, but it's very context dependent. Um, it, it depends not just on the species and the ecology, uh, it depends on the kinds of space you have available to transform or restore, and it depends on the kind of support that you have available. So is the local council on board? Are the people that live nearby on board? Is there, are there the resources and maintenance? You know, all of these things have to be pulled together in any kind of prioritisation for an urban environment. So I think that Ecologically, there are very few species that can't survive in cities if we make the right changes. Um, but that's my gut feeling. We, we still need the research on that. But, you know, species don't have inherent anti-urban traits. Urban environments have inherent anti-species <laughs> anti traits. And we built the urban environment the way it is, so we could build it a different way if we want. Um, and that's what I, I try to think about in any kind of prioritisation is changing the environment, not ruling species out of contention. I think that's a very interesting point about us having these created these built environments and we have 
all the flexibility to do something different with them if we choose. So yeah. thank you so much for answering those questions and I'll throw it back to Fern. Thanks so much, Andy, and thanks to Lisa and to Kylie as well. Um, there's a bit of chat in the comments about the sound at the start with Lisa's talk, so just reiterating our apology around that. We couldn't fix it during the talk, but um, yeah, hopefully you could um, gather enough of what Lisa was saying. I hope that was okay. Um, that brings to an end today's seminar session. If you want to listen back to any of this or share it with people, the recording will be available in a few days and we will share that on the ARI seminar page on the website. Um, please look that up. Subscribe if you're not already a subscriber to our seminar series. That's going to be it for the rest of 2021, but we'll be back next year with another series of seminars. Um, if you are a person who might like to present in our seminar series, get in touch with us and let's chat. Um, but for now, I'd just like to thank you so much. Thanks for all the questions that were posted today. Thanks particularly to Kylie and Lisa for presenting today. It was fantastic. And thanks so much to Andy for tech today. And as always, it's been terrific. So thanks everyone and um, have a great end of the year. Keep well. Um, make the most of urban nature if you're in the city and that actually reminds me, get along to Patricia Piccinini's exhibition at the Flinders Street Ballroom because it's all about a new relationship with nature. Get along and check it out. Thanks so much everyone. See you later. Bye.